appropriately need the microphones. Uh, so welcome and welcome back, everybody. Um, it is a real honor to have we did the first Ukrainian event in our team this semester uh, with our guest uh, Volodymyr Rafenko and Maria Yenkin, who will interpret uh, both from English into Ukrainian and from Ukrainian into English. And um, not here with us, unfortunately, today because he couldn't make it on such a short notice, is uh, Mark Andrejcik, the translator of this beautiful book that just came out recently from uh, Harvard Ukrainian Institute series. And instead of uh, introducing our guest author today in my own words, I, I thought I would simply quote uh, Mark's introduction, or at least some of those uh, passages. And uh, after that, uh, Volodymyr will start the conversation then we will have a bilingual reading from his both books, uh, one which was written in Russian a much longer time ago than this, and which has not come out in um, English yet, uh, and then uh, from On the Green, which we are really presenting today. And also today here with us are two counter students, one actually is an alumna, uh, and one is still a student, uh, Sam Bodomer, and Diana Gore, who have bravely and generously agreed to read the English translation. So, uh, born and raised and educated in Donetsk, the largest city in Ukraine's easternmost Donbass region, Rafinko is a writer, a poet, a translator, a literary critic, an editor, and a film critic. He's also a scholar who completed postgraduate studies in literary theory at Donetsk University. Additionally, he's the author of 100 or more crime fiction novels and popular education books written under a pen name, which I think we are not disclosing. <laughs> <laughs> um, this book, uh, which really is the occasion uh, for today's reading, On the Green, is the seventh novel uh, by Volodymyr, but it is the first novel that he has written in Ukrainian. Prior to this novel, Rafienko had established himself as a successful Ukrainian Russophone writer and received multiple prizes, um, particularly um, his novel from 2014, Dikarta's Demon, Demon Dikarta, was awarded the Russian prize and was the finalist for the 2014 Nos Literature Prize. It is also in this novel, uh, that uh, in a very eerie way, his native city uh, of Donetsk is allegorically referred, referred to as the Z town or the Z city, which will also figure in this book, something that kind of defies anything, any rational explanation given um, the scary symbolism of this non really clever in the last several months, so since February 24. Um, as of writing this introduction, the translator says, uh, in spring 2021, the war between Russia and Ukraine continues. Uh, that is to say, continues since 2014 at least, and has resulted in over 13,000 deaths. Again, this was before February 24 of this year. It has also led to the displacement of over one and a half million people from Crimea and from the occupied regions in the eastern part of Ukraine. One such refugee is Volodymyr Rafienko, uh, and he will probably say uh, much more about this, of changing not just the region, but also uh, the language in which he writes. So uh, let's welcome Volodymyr and Maria, and thank you so much uh, for agreeing to come. And we are already looking forward to welcoming you back to Hunter, maybe when the second book comes out or sooner. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening. I'm so glad to see everyone. And I'm going to be speaking in Ukrainian today because as a person who came from Ukraine, it's not only my language, it's my life. I, as uh, Yasha has said, I was born in the uh, city of Donetsk. Uh, I only spoke Russian, um, read in Russian, and um, the Ukrainian that I'm speaking to you right now, I, I didn't really know enough to speak. Um, I read, and I didn't even read that, uh, that often in Ukraine. I spoke and I wrote in Russian because my parents spoke to me in Russian. That was the language that was spoken in the family. This is a normal situation in the large industrial cities of the East Ukraine. After the Second World War, when you needed to uh, recover the cities and rebuild them, people from all over came, and the uh, Russian language came, the lingua franca for those areas that uh, when as they were trying to rebuild. But the language of the small towns and small villages all around the, that area, um, there was and still is Ukrainian. But in 2014, we saw an influx of the um, Russian um, uh, fighters that uh, came to defend um, uh, with basically the um, the slogans of defending Russians and, and Russian language. This was called Russian Spring, but in fact it was an annexation of Ukrainian territory. And all these slogans about the defending of the Russia of the Russian speaking people, they were all lies. It was uh, they counted for uh, uh, Western European uh, and Western um, consumption. I was very comfortable for 45 years speaking in Russian, writing books in Russian, and getting the international prizes uh, in Moscow. So I didn't need to be I didn't need to be defended against uh, my own uh, um, fatherland. No, so I realized I need to leave and I left to go to Kiev. So I, I came to Kiev with a goal to actually learn the language in such a on such a level that I can also speak it and also can write in it. Uh, it was important for me to show that for Ukrainian, even the Russian-speaking Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language cannot be a problem. So I, I wrote a novel in Ukrainian, which you see here, that was published in Harvard uh, in the beginning of this 2022. Uh, right before they, they had a full scale invasion. So before the February 24th, 2022, I, I thought that I'm going to write in two languages. Uh, but right now, I'm convinced that I'm going to continue writing only in Ukrainian until the end of my days. Uh, 
Это же было не причиной середины. Because in 2014, all these slogans about defending Russian speakers actually made me the reason for this war. После 24 лютого цього року мені взагалі боляче, що хтось може подумати, що я відношуся до сучасної російської культури. And after the February 24th, 2022, uh, it actually pains me that somebody can think that I'm a part of the Russian culture, no, contemporary Russian culture. No, I'll be glad to answer your questions uh, if you have them afterwards. So, should we uh, probably listen to very brief excerpts from the two books uh, and keep the questions until after? Okay. So, Simon, yeah, would you like to come here and change places? <coughs> this is a Russian, uh, a Russian language book that Volodymyr has uh, written. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a book he wrote in 2014 through 2016. Uh, so it was his first book after he was forced to leave Donetsk and it was written in Russian still. <laughs> Магнатий пах мужчинати глибокий шептав йому, що пройдеться, обов'язково закінчиться. І давно сказав. У руку такий карнавал, говорив Люся, смотрела глазами, большими, чорними, як ночі на бідних сірах на Криму. Нічого вже не повернеться, нічого вже тут не буде. Помню, шла я перед вами. Ми чуть не приходили, троє з автоматами. Предупредили, якщо ще раз вони на своєму сайті напишуть, що не буде чесне. Русська ідея схлопочуть по полю жоли. І що? Сушкин сел на диване и думал, что чего будет ожидать, а вот что. Люся пожала плечами, собрали вещи, утром уехали. Пока ты спал, я сказала по телефону, говорила. Она ключи оставила у коров, просила взять кошку и поливать цветы. Какие-то документы нужно забрать у нее, сейф и офис. Какие документы? Сказала важный, пожала плечами Люся, ну вот, по мрачной Сушкин твоей побудет, как всегда. Еще счастливо обошлось, добавила Люся, могли бы ребят кинуть в подвал бывшего его, мало ли там народа уже. И чтоб тогда встала среди детьми, хама вздохнул, глядя на солнечные пятна, бегающие по стене. Громко и весело скрипела карусель за окном, лаял пес, Люся ждала, что хама что-нибудь скажет, и не дождалась. Поднялась и ушла. Сушкин на винтаз слушал уже отчаянные воды в ванной. Теплый ветер надувал полоса, что на детской площадке кричали семейные здесь, заболели глаза. И он думал о том, что которая ночь не может нормально спать в центре по ночам в пузе. Знать бы кто и зачем, а главное куда. Может, лучше не знать никому, что думал он. Слишком много грабят защитники русского мира, банки, магазины, частный бизнес. Причем не все, по той причине. И от этого еще страшнее. Ты больше не знаешь этот город, понятия не имеешь, как в нем жить и чего от него ждать. Городской транспорт, выходят на маршруты, коммунальщики сажают цветы, убирают улицы и возят мусор. Не покинувшие из этой ежедневно идут на работу, удивительно много порядка. Несмотря на то, что им никто не озабочен, люди остаются людьми. И город полный, как чаша журчащие ручьями, прудами, речушками, шумящие, ярко зернеющие деревья, что поглушительно пахнущие цветами, остаются горы, хотя все больше напоминают декорацию гостей. Правительственные войска на подступ в это скоро здесь будут бои, сюда идут враги. Вокруг давно уже гибнут люди, а здесь фонтаны и цветы. Жизнь в защелтых шумах, синий мигающий глаз, последняя тишина. Запах цветов слишком насыщен, он мешает дышать уже. Густой аромат учащает пульс, испаренная духота, и в силах со вкус самых обычных продуктов. Хлеб и ракей, сахар и излишний сладок, чрезмерно соленый сок. От пронзительной синего неба с одни лобные доли подрагивает за речки и хочется пить. Чрезмерно и обособленно, как долгая боль, стали звуки, чувства, невыносимый половой рад. Разговор, звук, музыка, люди. Прекрасный мир в отсутствии времени. Вернулась Люся, села на диван, глядя в растворенную балконную дверь. Сломалась, что-то сказал Сушкин. Это не восстановить никому. Ни Гамлета, ни Офелия, ни Андреасия. Хорошо бы сейчас в Копенгаген, сказали Люся. Сесть на лавочку в парке, сигареты покурить. Мне так хочется жить, Сушкин. Но так мы и живем, и мы не живем. Мы выживаем, и дальше будет хуже. Мы только в начале, поверь мне, Люся. Люся право подумал, хама. 
Но ей легче ехать из-за этого, кроме Сушкина, у нее никого, а вот у Холом двоюродный дядя, девочка Лиза, родина дочка погибшей сестры, они никуда не поедут. Остаться и бежать, да, чего вопрос. Когда бы знать, проговорил Сушкин, виновато улыбаясь, что из этого весона деньги начинаются реально. И все тому она пожала плечами, закурила, окуталась дымом. Когда ты решишься, не понимая, что в городе стараться не надо. Завтра поговорим с дядей, стараясь не поделиться весен. Слива в глаза, хамар прямится. Sushkin calmed Yusa down, stroked her hair, kissed her mossy little forehead that smelled of mint, and whispered into it. Everything will pass. All this has to come to an end. It's a carnival here. What carnival's like this? Yusa said. She looked with eyes as big and black as nights above Annex Crimea. Nothing would come back any longer, and nothing more would ever be here. Remember Slavik and Clara? Three guys with machine guns showed up at their place at night. They warned them if they wrote anything else unflattering about the Russian idea on their site, they'd each get they each get a bullet in the belly. And what? Sushkin sat down on the couch and started flicking his lighter. And so, Yusha shrugged, they packed their things in the morning they left. I talked with Clara on the phone while you were sleeping. She left her keys with her co-workers. She asked me to take her cat and to water the plants and to pick up some kind of documents from the safe in her office. What kind of documents? She said important ones, Yusa shrugged. So fine, Sushkin darkened. Her girlfriend's just like always. And they were lucky, Yusa added. They could have thrown them into the cellars of the former Ukrainian ser security services building. Aren't a lot of people there already? And then what would have happened with their children? Homa sighed looking at the spots of sunlight running over the wall. The carousel outside the window was creaking loudly and merrily. A dog barked. Yusa waited for Homa to say something, but he didn't. She got up and went out. For five minutes or so, Sushkin listened to the water dripping in the bathroom. A warm wind filled the sails of the curtains. Children shouted and laughed on the playground. His eyes hurt, and he thought about how for a few nights he hadn't been able to sleep properly. There was a shooting downtown at night. If only he knew who and why, and the main thing, where. Maybe it's better not to know, she suddenly thought. The defenders of the Russian world were stealing too much. Banks, stores, private businesses, though not all of them. It was selective somehow, and that made it some even more frightening. You no longer know the city. You have no idea how to live in it and what to expect from it. Public transit goes out along its routes. City employees plant flowers, clean the streets, pick up trash, People who haven't abandoned Z go to work. There's a surprising amount of order, even though no one is concerned with it. People remain people, and the city, and sorry, and the city full of a cha chalice, sorry, full as a chalice, babbling with brooks, ponds, streams, rustling with bright green trees, smelling deafeningly of flowers, remains a city, although it reminds you more and more of a stage set. Government forces are approaching the outskirts of Z, and soon there will be fighting here. War is coming this way. People have been perishing around us for a long time now. While there are fountains and flowers here, life in the eye of a typhoon, a dark blue unblinking eye, the ultimate silence. The smell of flowers is too concentrated. It interferes with breathing and living. The thick aroma speeds up your heart rate, perspiration and stuffiness. The most ordinary food, bread and beer, have started to taste stronger. Sugar is excessively sweet, salt is overly salty. Your frontal lobes ache from the piercing blue of the sky, your eyes twitch and you want to drink. Sounds and feelings turn, feelings turn extraordinary, isolated, like extended pain. Sexual acts are intolerable. Conversations, smiles, music, the wind, a splendid world in the absence of harmony. Yusa came back and sat down on the couch, looking out the open balcony door. Something's broken, said Sushkin, and no one can restore it. Neither the Hamlets, nor the Ophelias, nor the OSCE. It would be, sorry, it would be good to go to Copenhagen now, said Yusa. Sit on a bench in Tivoli Park and light a cigarette. I want so much to live, Sushkin. Well, so we're living. We aren't living, we're surviving. And it's just going to get worse. We're just at the beginning. Trust my intuition. Yus is right, thought Poma. But it's easier for her to leave Z. Besides Sushkin, she has no one here. Whereas Sushkin has a great uncle and a little girl, Liza, his dead sister's adopted daughter. They won't be going anywhere. Stay or flee? That's the question. If only we could know, Sushkin spoke up, smiling guiltily. What is the dream in all this, and where the reality in it begins? Yusa shrugged, exhausted, lit a cigarette, wrapped herself in smoke. 
When will you make up your mind? Don't you understand that we can't stay in the city? I'll talk to my uncle tomorrow. Trying not to look into Deuce's plum-colored eyes, Alma started getting dressed. Прибули на стільки ті років, коли на початку такого господу. Не має значення, коли саме він поїхав за куповими годинами. Взяв манатки та перебрався в місто сакральної краси. Тут багато чого чекало доброго, наприклад, відсутність і діло гарячки було та російських підписників. Але в буті раптово з'явилося багато несподіваного. Вони вискочили з набуття, як колоб з комоти, і змушували до себе якось ставитися. Несподіванки траплялися приємні, неприємні. Були і такі, що спочатку не уявляли ні позитивного заряду, ні негативного, хоча поглинали більшу частину духовного здоров'я проселенців, як от, скажімо, метрополітен чи жінки з дозу. Але найпеголовнішою новиною стала українська мова, співуча та прекрасна. З одного боку, цією мовою до маленького габу в дитинстві говорили Соловей, Миша, Тулик і чудесний Кабачок, вже не кажучи про комедачу голову. За іншого річ, що ми полягали, що з ними, з цим хробаком, тепер потрібно було регулярно спілкуватися. От як це пояснити? Важкувати, але діватися нема куди. Ну, дивіться. Габу українського читав майже з самого дитинства. Любив читати українською. Хоча, звичайно, російською читати було не зрівняно легше. Але розмовляти українською він не вмів зовсім, бо в рідному місці розгадати мову йому було не схід. І в дорослому віці не запретелювали з кількома розумними та й хорошими українськими хлопцями. Одні... Однак ті спілкувалися українською тільки між собою, мабуть, зберігаючи таким чином вірність касті українофілів. Кілька разів просили Габа говорити з ним саме українською, прийнято у своє коло втаємничених та національно звичних фігурів. Ясно, що він нікому не сказав би про це і тримав би таємниці до самої смерті. В Донбасі українського городу самі патріоти, а україномовна інтелігенція за дні промажені по всьому не приїздили. Посміхалися на це прекрасні мольфари Донбасу, варувалися, мило соромилися. Та придбавши горілку і завідки, сівши за спільний стіл, все одно переходили на російську. Так їм було простіше. Габа розуміє цей феномен. Асимілюватися цілком зрозуміли бажання в місті, де, починаючи з полуоліта, місцеві мешканці просили Путіна ввести війська. Очманіли мамутус, тусять довкола про російські транспаранти та почав біля вода. Але в поведінці ці хлопці відчувалися дещо інше. Наприклад, що вони з великою любов'ю ставили до своєї мови. І от у глибині душі їм здавалося, що говорить цієї мови з мешканцями Донбасу немає жодного сенсу. Все одно, що перед свиннями розсипати пену. Ну, сорі, може не так категорично. Не перед свиннями, а, скажімо, під іжачками, хробачками, гілочками. Вайлуватими й недолугими бобрами та гімотами, але яка тобі це різниця? Соромилися ці хлопці своєю мовою, одночасно самих себе соромилися перед цією мовою. Та й меншу вартість і велика, справжня ірландська гордість пільки пилі в озварі їхньої близьковічної провінційної свідомості і ради на те не було ніякої. Тому в тілокі малята і не мала Україна шансів на порозуміння між різними прошарками інтелектуальних еліт і утворення єдиної нації Соловідів і москвелі ненавісники. Нікому не боліло формування спільного культурного простору, вже не кажучи про космічні польоти чи розумні рівноваження індивідуальні мовні квоти, принаймні в межах Донбасу. Але зараз, зараз Україна наша єдина лялька, а не країна. Вчителька Дивиться замислено на клас, клас, замислено на вчительку. Святе Сяєва відходить від учнів, алілуя, звучить завітними, алілуя, хором кажуть діти, школа підіймається у небо і зникає за хмарами. Так от, ясно, що сенсу щось промовляти самому до себе українською не було взагалі. Могли застосувати примусове лікування. Тоді зворотного шляху габи взагалі б не було. То який сенс було розмовляти? Ніякого. Мова повинна бути живою і важливою, це їй так потрібно, не нам. Останній поцілунок жінки твоєї долі, подожі Марко Пола, блаженні сновидіння дитинства, літургія сільської церкви, де присутні тільки ти і старенькі священники. Боже, матір Кирильська, Анна, написані Грубелем із пацієнтів психіатричної лікарні. Павлеська, психоневрологічна, номер один. Ці ангели мешкають там і досі. У хрицю купи з приємною людиною, розмову до схочу з померлими друзями. А передовсім майбутнє кохання, що стоїть просто сонце на тонких, я скло при чуттях усе це мова. Щось таке, що народ відчується з мови, мовою тримається і мовою стає. Мова – це багато чого, але вона повинна бути потрібна. Тоді ти її вживаєш, а вона тебе любує. Працює цей механізм за зразком причастя. Приймаєш і тіло, забуваєш холодним класом за рідзинками, 
и витаешь по лету гранку дымочек. Хай там я когда-то еще до войны гад воспринимал довольно спокойно и свои початки стал выглядеть незручнейшим. Не говорить державную мову, то еще и проживающие в Киеве в час войны было как-то неудобно, если вы понимаете, про что идете. Когда Габинский приехал в Киев, то увидел, что место переважно размовляет себя прекрасно, хотя и не очень чистой мовой Урала. Хунта позиционировалась как украинская, а мова в столице панувала российская. Словно единственный парадокс, парадокс Шрейдингера в том, что полягал, что Украина есть, а не видно. Она водночас и мертва, и жива, скажем, наша мать и природа, чи власне украинская держава. Но Габи не разгубился и намеру своего не облишил. Украинского часа матушка, чтобы и шло швидше, с певного часа размовляли с собой только нею. Звідки ляще казал он себе, прийде до Киева автентична украинская культура, как не в Донецке. Что за маячня сделать свет? Хиба же может быть из Назарета, что с добре суто так бы мовити генетичным, то есть науково национальным сердцем? Ці Галилеи, бачите, по новой язычнице, да шахтари, там так непевно и разноманитно кровь смешана с угилем, там с теплыми серыми хмарами, что мы майже не маем генетичных сподіваний на что-то файное. Генетика и вегетарианство, как всем известно, это наше все, или все ж таки не все. Когда посмехнется, привет, привет, кисню за бой скажет, прийдите, то побачите на власні очи мои солоденькие, прийдите, то побачите, и может вы наважитесь колись, но не зараз, ні, ніяк не зараз. Чтобы пойти сюда, не сказать матерку Киев пасажирский, Габа Гайбинский решил сделать все возможное и неможное, чтобы опанувати спевучую вода и закид природы. Вода и нерівный метеллинка, или, скажем, Геральд и Уэлса. Почему власне нет? А вот тут и выявилось, что в случае с мовой топит, владевает не так уж и ничего. Approximately X number of years ago, at the beginning of a certain century, it doesn't matter exactly when he left his occupied home, he grabbed his rags and moved to the city of the Sacral Force. Many good things awaited him here. For example, the absence of the Islamic State, of the Ebola virus, and of Russian tourists. But many surprises also emerged in everyday life. They jumped up from non-existence like a jack-in-the-box and required attention. There were both pleasant and unpleasant surprises. There were those that, at the outset, would elicit neither positive nor negative energy, but would nonetheless suck up a great deal of the refugee's spiritual health, like, let's say, the Metro or the Obolon women. But the most overwhelming revelation was the Ukrainian language. It was melodious and delightful. On the one hand, this was the language that was spoken to little Haba in his childhood days by the nightingale, the mouse, the rooster, and the wonderful worm, let alone the mare's head. On the other hand, the fact of the matter was that he now had to converse with it, that worm, regularly. How can this be explained? It is difficult, but what can you do? So here's the deal. Haba read in Ukrainian almost since he was a kid. He liked reading in Ukrainian, although it was much easier to read in Russian. And he wasn't able to speak in Ukrainian at all, because there was no one in his hometown with whom he could speak in that language. As an adult, he befriended a couple of smart and respectable Ukrainian-speaking guys, but they only spoke Ukrainian amongst themselves, perhaps preserving in that manner a dedication to the Ukrainian, Ukrainianophile guild. Several times, Haba asked them to speak to him in Ukrainian, to accept him into their circle of clan historian and national con nationally conscious individuals. And he, of course, promised not to tell anyone about this and that he would take this secret with him to the grave. Only patriots would speak Ukrainian in the Donbass and, in, and the Ukrainian intelligentsia from beyond the Dnieper River almost never came. Those wonderful molfars of the, Don of the Donbass would smile about this. They were evasive, they cordially expressed their shame. And when they would pick up some vodka and snacks and sit around a table, they would nonetheless switch to Russian. It was easier for them that way. Haba understood this phenomenon. Assimilation was a completely reasonable desire in a city where, stretching back to the Paleolithic times, the locals would ask Putin to bring his army. Crazed mammoths circle around pro-Russian placards fl flutter by the regional administrative building. But the conduct of these guys was somewhat different. For example, they truly loved their language. 
But deep in their souls, they believed that there was no sense conversing with inhabitants of the Donmas in this language. It was like casting pearls before swine. Okay, excuse moi, maybe not so categorically, maybe not before swine, but before, let's say, hedgehogs, little worms, or cute squirrels. Before clumsy and deficient beavers and raccoons. But what the hell is the difference? These guys were ashamed of their language, and they were ashamed of themselves before this language. Before inferiority and a great genuine Irish pride simmered in the in the compound of their starting startlingly provincial consciousness, and there was nothing that could there was nothing you there was nothing you that could be done. That is why, Keto, Ukraine has no had no chances for finding mutual understanding between the various layers of the intellectual elite and for the formation of a unified nation of pork fat eaters and ruski haters. No one was interested in establishing a common cultural space, not to mention space travel or smart, fair individual language quotas, at least not within the Donbass. But hold on, our Ukraine is the one and only, not a country, but a doll. The teacher looks on ponderingly at the class, the class ponderingly at the teacher. A holiness grows from the students. Hallelujah, children say in a, in a choir. The school rises to the heavens and disappears among the clouds. So then, obviously, there was no sense in uttering something to oneself in Ukrainian. They could have sent you to the nut house for that, and then there would be no way back for Hava. So what sense was there in conversing? None. Language needs to be living and vital. It's the one that needs this, not us. The final kiss from the woman of your dreams, the travels of Marco Polo, a liturgy in the, villa, in the village church where the only ones present are you and, the, and an old priest, the mother of God in St. Cyril's church, angels painted by Rubel using psych ward patients as models, pa, Pavlovus, Pavlovus psychoneurology, Neurologic Hospital Number One. Those angels live there to this day. A mug of hemlock offered to you by a pleasant person, talking for hours with deceased friends, and first and foremost, a future love that reveals itself in the most fragile of premonitions. All of this is language, something that is born from language, is sustained by language, and becomes language. Language is many things, and it must be, but it must be needed because then you use it and it forms you. This mechanism works like the Eucharist. You receive the body, wash it down with cold raisin flavored floss and fly through the heavens from morning till night. At any rate, that which Haba had accepted the calm, calmly before the war had become increasingly uncomfortable once it began. Not speaking the official language of Ukraine, especially while living in its capital, he, in a time of war, just ain't right, if you know what I mean. When Habinsky arrived in Kiev, he observed that, for the most part, the city speaks the same wonderful language that the enemy does, just with more mistakes. The Runta considered itself to be a Ukrainian one, but the language that predominated in the city was Russian. Schrodinger's famous cat paradox, in fact, dictates that Ukraine exists, but you can't see it. It's both dead and alive, like our mother nature, or in fact, Ukrainian statehood. But Hava was not flummoxed and stuck to his plan. He studied Ukrainian on his own, and to speed up the process, at some point he began talking to himself exclusively in Ukrainian, because he would ask himself, from where would authentic Ukrainian culture come to Kiev if not from Donetsk? It is this insanity, you may ask. How can something good come out of Nazareth? That is, in a purely genetic and thus scholarly national sense. In this Galilea, dear ladies and gentlemen, you've got pagans and coal miners. Their blood is so certainly and variably mixed with coal and with the gray clouds of the steppe that there can be no genetic hope for something groovy because genetics and vegetarianism, as everyone knows, are everything to us, or perhaps not everything. Philip will smile, check the level of oxygen in the coal mine and say, Come and you'll see with your own eyes, my dears. Come and you'll see. And maybe someday you will dare to do so. But not now. No, not now by any means. While still riding in the passenger train to Donetsk Z, Mother Kiev, Abba Abinsky, decided to do everything possible and impossible to grasp that musical language, even if it were to take him a few years. 
at least at the level of uh, Mater Ling, or let's say Herbert Wells. And why not? But it turned out that regarding language, who actually, who actually grasped whom is not so clear. This is a very musical, beautiful passage. <laughs> Thank you so much. If I may, just stay here. Okay. No, no. <laughs> you stay. <laughs> um, so, let me ask perhaps just the first question or two, uh, and I hope this serves as some sort of springboard for uh, further discussion, which we have plenty of time for. Uh, my questions are based solely on these two passages that. Uh, you just heard. Uh -huh. And one is about language, of course, or languages, and the other is about the two protagonists. So despite the fact that they speak now different languages, Sushkin speaking Russian and Haba speaking Ukrainian, uh, there still seems to be something, perhaps something autobiographical, uh, that they never nevertheless share, uh, even though Haba appears to be, to my very subjective perception, younger than Sushkin, despite being born later as a character. I may be completely wrong, uh, but that's <laughs> confess uh, my own perception here. The question is, what is it that they share and how are they different? Or is it just the effect of reading these two very different books one after another? Actually, you know, very clearly has a very Russian uh, last name, and he's very lost. He doesn't know what's happening. Whereas Haba is clearly um, uh, a Ukrainian of a Jewish descent, and he clearly knows what's happening. Uh, uh, I think it's they're about the same age, and maybe Haba is a little bit older, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and the second question is. I guess less about, about less literary, uh, so to say. Uh, but what has this um, tragic year revealed to you about language itself, rather than Russian language or Ukrainian language? And is it some kind of third space, perhaps, or third language that, however accented, or however imperfect it may be, uh, if only we talk about the characters, the two characters that speak two different languages, um, that is there any room, like is there any third language space between the two? <coughs> Звичайно, що цей рік пише, що я була в цей день. 
Я тут дуже не забув сказати чітко голосу вам на зрозуміти, що головне людське, людина полягається і покладається і живе до всякого. So that this uh, horrible year that really started like in February made me realize that the, the most important thing inside um, any person is uh, before the language. So, so your um, consciousness, <laughs> consciousness and love, they're not verbal um, concepts. So the, the big freedom is actually uh, the big call to choose the language. It's not more complicated than to choose your sexual orientation, your sex, your gender. <coughs> So before the war, my infantile thinking was that the language, the, everything that goes with it, is something that guarantees the humanity in person. But it's not true. Thank you so much. It is a question that we discuss at least twice a week in the course on literature in exile because some of us are sort of taken. Um, okay, then thank you, my part is done. Let's open it to um, to your questions, please, David. So I am fascinated by the hundred uh, crime novels <laughs> that you wrote under a pseudonym for two reasons. One is, if you were 20 years older and you had become a member of the Ukrainian Writers' Union, you couldn't have made a living on the side writing crime novels under uh, a pseudonym, I assume. So, did you, when, when you allow yourself to do that, is this something subversive, some expression of your freedom as a writer that you don't have, that you're not wedded to highbrow literature, you can also write popular literature, which is something new uh, in Russian, I, I, I would imagine. That's my first question. <laughs> the second has to do with the genre. Crime novels, uh, there are good guys and there are bad guys. And in the end, the crime is solved and the moral order is restored. But your other writing about war and occupation and destruction is very different. So what's, how do you reconcile these two modes of writing? Я 
там я, значит, перша. Ну, я не бачу протиріччя між письменницьким трудом як засобом заробітку і письменницьким трудом як засобом бути в бітті, так, перебувати і самостоїти, так, тобто тримати самостоїти. So I, I don't see a contradiction between the writing as the craft to earn money and writing as the way to self-create yourself, to actually the, the way to exist. Є різні типи поцілунків. Одним поцілунком ти цілуєш свою маму, з іншим поцілунком я буду кохати. There are different types of kisses. One kisses for the mother, another kisses for the lover. Це перше. І воно одне другому не заважає. So they don't really contradict the other. ти здорова людина. If you're a healthy person, you know, don't seem to be a Чого стосовно? Чи з пошукаємого? Звичайно, звичайно, в, скажімо, фрітейл, як і в цій популярній літературі, читач очікує, щоб його було наказано, і отримує. So in the fairy tales or in the popular literature, the, right, the reader expects the, uh, the bad guys to be punished and he gets what he deserves, what he, kind of what he expects, the resolution. So in a, this literature, the reader is actually expects um, some sort of light and understanding and the resolution in a different way. Але насправді це один і той і той же саме процес, тому що коли настає світло, темряви відступають. Це є той теж саме, що відбувається на простому рівні в цій поляні. But it but it's the same process because when the light shines on something and you get it, then the darkness recedes. So it actually what happens in the popular literature as well, there is this process of illumination that happens. Is that a good, good enough answer? <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask about the shift from writing in Russian to writing in Ukrainian. And um, I was wondering, like, for a reader who can read, who either read your novels in both Russian and Ukrainian, or is able to read in translation books that have been translated from both languages, do you think they experience a shift or a change in your writing style and your kind of overall authorial voice, but regardless of subject matter, or is it is the choice to um, write solely in Ukrainian now more a personal one that doesn't affect your um, kind of voice as an author as much? Um, so you mean between Russian and Ukrainian, yeah. if there is a change that you can read it in Russian novels and in Ukrainian to read others, but if you read it in Russian novels, you can read it in Russian novels, you can read it in Russian novels, you can read it in Russian novels, Безумовно, не письменник творить мову, мова творить письменник. It's not, the writer doesn't create the language, the language creates the writer. І на мій погляд, це завдання справжнього письменника полягає не в тому, щоб володіти мовою, а навпаки дати мові володіти другою. So the, the task of the real writer is not to be, uh, to kind of own the language and know how to use it, but it's actually to let the language to use you. Найкращі з письменників, наскільки я розумію, тому і являються для нас найкращими, і були, і стали, і війшли в канон певний, тому що в певний момент стали інструментами для власного діяння. So the best writers, you know, kind of that we respect as the best writers that became canonical uh, for the lack of a better word, are the ones that at some point became the instrument of their language. Але ясно, що Якщо я це виповнюю, всі виповнююсь мові, то вона вирішує, який я в цьому романі. Вона мене збирає заново. Вона вирішує, хто такий Володимир Афієнко. От Марсель Пруст казав, що немає жодного Марселя Пруста для написання роману. Французька мова вирішує, яким буде Марселю Пруста. Да? Українська вирішує на власному полі, але російська на своєму теж вирішує. So the language really decides what kind of writer I'm gonna be in, in, in this novel and similar to how Marcel Proust used to say that there is no Marcel Proust until the novel is written. It's the same way with me with the language. The language decides what kind of I'm going to be in this novel or in that novel.
So in the story that was uh, just read to us, we heard about a character, a Russian-speaking character, who had difficulty um, learning Ukrainian. When you moved to uh, Kiev, was it difficult for yourself to learn Ukrainian? Ну, мені було 45 років, я був вже не, не молодий хлопчик, і вчити було важко, тим більше, що впало ці мої зусилля на е, те, що називається хомлес, ці всі проблеми пов'язані з цим вимушеним перегляденням. Um, this is a long question, so stop me, thank you. Um, so in the section that I read, um, there aren't that many Shakespeare references, but in the rest of it there is. There's some Hamlet references, there's some uh, Othello references. Um, but what I was really interested in was um, Yusha's kind of I want to live line, and which just, you know, it was written in Russian. So for me, it's like if it's a Russian kind of literary reference, I think of like Chekhov and I want to live or we will live, all that stuff. But given that, you know, you're Ukrainian and it's like the phrasing is like, like I want so much to live, it's not I will live. And I think with Russian, it's this expectation that you're gonna be alive, you know, it's this kind of passive um, thing that you don't really think about, but with Ukrainian, it's sort of an active desire and a constant kind of you need to have control over your own existence. So I was wondering like, if there's kind of any, like if that was an intention there, if perhaps maybe it was instead a reference to like, yes, Ukrainska was kind of often um, references to her wanting to live in her writing, um, et cetera, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Translation from Russian, so yeah. like, this is, so it's, uh, this is it more is, Chekhov than or like you know, yeah. more natural for him to use what that's yeah. crazy. Chekhov, yeah. the famous one, Budim Zhik, right? Yeah. We will live, not we want to live. Yeah. That's I think what he only wants to do. So Chekhov. Can we reformulate a little bit like the question itself? Well, well, it's just like there's a lot of Shakespeare references, so I was assuming there might be some other kind of literary references. So I was. She gets to make the question of the mood of the, okay, whether it's just a statement, we will, or I will, or whether it's a desire, I want to. No, so the, the, for this particular uh, heroine, uh, this character in the book, uh, the point is that she actually knows that she is not going to be living uh, to it. And uh, you know, she says it because she knows that her life is over. So yes, it is a clear allusion to Chekhov and the three sisters that they really want to go to Moscow, but they know they're not going to go to Moscow. But she knows that she's already destined uh, not to live. So like, yes, there are a lot of allusions to Shakespeare because I know him almost by heart and I'm actually teach him in my uh, courses and literature, so it, it is very Shakespearean. Um, um, <laughs> so, yeah, so 
this Shakespeare is pretty close to Ukrainians. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you speak more about the decision, like this conscious um, decapitalization of, of Russian in the, in the email invite, and maybe just about the role of language in contemporary Russian culture? I mean, we obviously see it being weaponized, but I mean, there are some people I follow that are activists, and you know, you know, they're using language to speak against the regime, so just broadly speaking about it. <laughs> So, but there are no languages, and I should really say there's a language because at this point we're only talking about um, that is used by the Russians and the Russian um, uh, state as uh, a weapon. Like I was telling you my story, you know, they've, uh, um, they came with slogans of defending the Russians, so from the very beginning they've been using the language as a weapon as well. And that's exactly how they use the culture. Uh, the uh, 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 so this is not something that began with Putin. This this has been used by the Russian Empire, you know, for a long time. Putin Russian people, Russian people The Putin hasn't Putin has not, has not invented the Russian people, the Russian people have invented or created Putin. So, of course, there are people, and wonderful people, and even people like me, who, for whom it's, it's a native language, the Russian language. But if you live in a country that's uh, being destroyed uh, with the help of that language, you have to make a choice. Yeah. And I'd like you to understand, I'm, I'm not trying to judge people who are not able to make that decision. And in, in all these questions, the question of guilt and the question of what are your next steps are, are very individual and should be decided by, by the person. Also mentioned as part of my question, um, I've been I'm a, a Russian speaker from Ukraine, and I recently have been reading an essay by um, Gloria Andaldura, who is a Chicano um, a writer uh, who writes a lot about um, language in the borderlands, and she says in that essay that um, I am my language, that her language is her is her identity, and I've been struggling a lot with that. Um, 
being from Ukraine, but also being a Russian speaker. Um, I'm kind of wondering if you can um, expand a little bit on your sort of personal, not public journey um, in transitioning into Ukrainian and how that affects your identity. Okay. Um, чи мова дійсно є ідентичністю, як чи ви могли б трошки підшлювати більше свій приватний вибір, чи є мова для вас ідентичністю, скажімо. Ну, я вже сказав, але я ще раз повторю, що вся ця історія має власну історію. Чому вона на тому, що це головне діління, та банка, доброго, красового, своїх спалень, воно не існує на мовному рівні, воно домовне. What I got taught by this experience is that all the, you know, the good in person, like the, um, the beauty, the, the kindness, the consciousness, the conscious, um, it, it all kind of exists on the favorable level, it's not about the language. Тому, я навіть простіше скажу, ну, для мене рідна мова російська мова. І для моєї мами, і для мого тата вона була російська теж рідна мова. А для моїх бабців, що мами не, що тата не, рідна мова була українська. So like, in a more simpler term, like, my language, my native language was Russian, my parents' native language was Russian, but for both of my grandmothers, the native language was Ukrainian. І причина цьому політика радянського влади, радянського союзу, яка засіщувала промисловий регіон навмисно і дуже методично і конкретно. So the, the reason for that change was that with the politics of the Soviet Union that was trying to russify the industrial areas of the Soviet Union and uh, eradicating the Ukrainian languages from it. So I, I read my first books in Russian, but then the, the first fairy tales I actually heard in Ukrainian. Вот такая моя мовная ситуация. Звичайно, что до 45 років я думал, писал, читал, вчився и вчив людей уже сам російську мову. So before I turned 45, I, I read, I thought, I uh, studied and, and I was teaching in Russian. И она, эта мова, я думаю, яка як для кожної одномовної людини, для мене співпадала і з совістю, і з, і з, і з добром, і з красою. Вона не співпадала. Тобто тут вербальність цієї мови вона була така для мене настільки рідна, що вона співпадала з невербальністю. So but because you know for every uh, person with a single language, with a monolingual person, that uh, language actually um, uh, corresponds perfectly to all these like you know the, the kindness, the truth, the beauty, because that's the only thing you know. So it, it, it's very linked together when you only speak one language. Цих перевісних довербальних власних людських речей з інструментом мовлення, з мовою як такою конкретно. So my, my personal journey through these years actually has severed the relationship between the language and all these uh, kind of truths that live in me. Um, and it's, it's no longer you know, corresponds so neatly to it. А коли це, це, це важкий процес, і це дуже нелегко пережити, але коли це відбулося. І відбулось на усвідомлено, тобто більше того, я намагався керувати значить, своїми мовами з чогось іншою, то я тепер не відчуваю дискомфорту, коли розмовляю з жінкою виключно своєю жінкою виключно українською мовою. So it was a very difficult process because uh, you know it's, it's not easy, but I was trying to kind of curate this experience and manage my experience of learning the second language. And it, once it happened, I actually don't feel discomfort in speaking to my wife in Ukrainian and being completely Ukrainian inside of us. So in the family life, we only speak Ukrainian now. Yeah, 
Sergio, at least in this so, Sometimes I may say something in Russian, but now I'm learning English now, so I may say something in English because <laughs> sometimes that comes up. I, I just wanted to ask him maybe on a little bit of a lighter note if you had mm -hmm. any Ukrainian voices, writers, stories that you can recommend to us. You know, maybe you know if they're translated, but just some voices that you can recommend. Андрохович Юрко Сергій Жадан це сучасні ну тут багато поетів. Я не знаю, хто з них перекладений. Ну, скажімо, Кеновську потрібно читати, бо вона точно перекладена. Це дуже сучасний, дуже потужний, дуже власний поет. Ну а загалом це список 50-70 авторів. Я боюся, що буду забути на назву. So he named three uh, major prose names, which is Sofia Androkovich and Yuri Androkovich, mm -hmm. and then Sergei Jadan. And also there are too many, you know, uh, good poets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Vladimir doesn't know who's translated, who's not, but for example, Mariana Kremovska is definitely translated, and you need to read her. Um, and I, I might mention that there are a lot more poets that are translated, mm -hmm. and it's indeed, you know, the, the poetry is well translated at this point. Um, so there are quite maybe like 50 to 70 names, and he's afraid to name them all and like forget somebody. And do you know, Kievsky University, they did a translation of Yekichuk Chipto. Yeah, Lost Horse Press. There is there's a small um, publishing press in uh, Iowa or Idaho. No, Seattle. They moved, they moved to Seattle, called Lost Horse Press, and we have one of the authors and translators with us here. Uh, and they have a wonderful series of translation from poetry uh, called the Ukrainian Poetry Series, that I think at this point is close to 20 different books with different authors. Oh, wow. um, and also, you know, the Harvard, this series right. includes some uh, poetry books, including one curated by Ostap, who is here. So it's going to come out very, very shortly. Under what conditions do you dream in either language? You don't dream in the language. You don't dream in the language. There's no truth to that. So the language comes in your uh, in your dreams when you start waking up. So like the, the deep uh, sleep is actually only happens on a pre-verbal level. So when you speak to your conscious, you don't speak in a language. It's your heart speaks to you to you um, on a pre-verbal level. You mentioned that the second protagonist is of Jewish descent. So has your switch from Russian to Ukrainian affected your Jewish consciousness, so to speak, or your consciousness of, uh, or your awareness of the Jewish presence in your life? Okay, so he, he thinks that maybe like the Jewish blood actually helped to awaken identity as such, and then you know Ukrainian identity is part of it. Справа в тому, що Гавапій Гавінський це ну пряма алюзія на Ахамела Гавріла, це взагалі пряма алюзія на того. Там багато такого в цьому романі, і в цьому сіслі, в цьому сенсі, в цьому сенсі саме Гава Гавінський це така, це такий персонаж на, на межі між, між Тору і Ван. So Haba, who is a protagonist of this book, is actually Gabriel or, or Gabriel, and it's a direct link to Torah. So it's it's a character that's kind of in between the worlds, and uh, 
Uh, there is definitely that allusion uh, in the book. Between the, 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 the concessions, between the worlds, between the, the languages. So it's, it's a life at the frontier. Um, it's just been, since the very first day of the war, something that is interesting that so many people have tried to uh, find an explanation for, and I don't think anyone has. I mean, uh, the letter that does not come from any, it's not the Jewish alphabet, obviously, it's not the Cyrillic alphabet, uh, but it is a letter that you kind of assigned to uh, the next way before it acquired these ominous uh, meanings and connotations much more with a visual symbol than a letter, at least to me. Again, could you just speak a little bit more about this? Yes, it's a poem that was for Victor Vasilis, it was in the hands of the Ukrainians, so it was written so many years ago, I think I was always so curious to show the letter, what exactly it meant. So these two books are actually part of the trilogy. So the first book, uh, uh, this is where the, uh, the city Z first uh, came to be, and it was written about 2012-2013. So, and, and that first uh, book is actually finishes with the war starting in Donetsk, uh, in the steppe near Donetsk. And, uh, so the, the second book is, is the war. So the, the third book is sort of like a post-war when the person tries to find itself in the displaced world and in the new language and kind of in this post-war state. So in all three books, uh, the, uh, the city Z is my my hometown in Donetsk. So the, the first uh, city, it's not clear what city that is, although you can probably guess that it's Donetsk. So the, in the third book, I actually use both city Z and Donetsk uh, decor. So in, in the first uh, novel, there was actually an allusion to the uh, philosophy of Descartes. 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 Um, and, and the uh, name of the book was the uh, Descartes' uh, Demon. So the, the Descartes' uh, system of the coordinates, which you know, uh, crosses at zero, and that's kind of the Z is a zero for that. So the, the zero is something that uh, doesn't have a, a, a contact, a content, but at the same time, the content is not possible without that zero. So this is very similar to Heidelberg's uh, nothing, because this the city that's uh, kind of everything starts there, but you can't really define it by you know what that actually is. So it, it's kind of all the senses start from that from that point.
one more <coughs> question with your reason. So if not, then, then let's thank Vladimir, Maria, and Sam, and Diana, and everyone else. Uh, thank you. Uh, we also have some book copies uh, for sale for $20 each, which Vladimir will be pleased to sign, if you'd like. And um, let's get the box to time. So or it's actually this here. This okay. says we have uh, some uh, before it was it's kind of printed and being the stores. The publisher has sent us some of the copies. Okay, well. uh, the Lens of Days, Dolgatadni, the, uh -huh, the Lens of Days. Uh -huh. yeah, In the beginning, I think I said that. You said there's nothing. Okay. Okay. Actually, have it's here, <laughs> so you, you, you have the chance to give. I think it's for you for this essentially, and like or he printed some for the conference that's gonna happen uh -huh. in Chicago, so that we are lucky enough to have some of the. Is, is the first book um, translated? Uh, the very first one. Yeah. Uh, but you can read it kind of without that. Is, is it kind of a loose trilogy? It's, yeah. The old standalone. <laughs> yeah. It's actually not translated to Ukrainian either. Oh, wow. There's some work to be done. All right, once again, thank you so much.